I think we're back. So thank you all for joining us uh, again um, after this uh, very inspiring uh, keynote speech. Each I think we've uh, kicked off the uh, the conference in the best possible way, and we're going to continue in the same uh, spirit uh, with the uh, first panel which is uh, the panel on reflections on the interpretation of customary international law. Uh, in this panel, uh, we have uh, Professor Pauline uh, Vesterman, who will be speaking about the illusion of gold digging interpretation of state practice. Dr. Eleni Micha from the University of Athens, uh, who's going to be speaking about custom dynamics and the interpretation exercise. And Dr. Craig Eggert from the Maastricht University, who's going to be speaking about the general principles of law and the interpretation of custom. Uh, a few things. I'll be introducing each speaker uh, before uh, they uh, make their presentation. Uh, each speaker will have uh, approximately uh, 20 uh, minutes. We kindly ask you to, to keep to between 15 and 20 minutes a maximum so that then we also have the uh, possibility uh, of having a fruitful uh, discussion. Um, so uh, we'll start with uh, Professor uh, Pauline uh, Westermann, who's uh, from our university, the University of Groningen. Professor Westermann is the professor in the philosophy of law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Groningen, also the head of the uh, Department of TLS of Transboundary uh, Legal Studies. She's also uh, a member of the Academy for Legislation uh, in The Hague, and uh, she recently uh, published uh, a book on outsourcing uh, the Law, A Philosophical Perspective on uh, Regulation, uh, published by Edward uh, Elger, and which, uh, based on what is happening now, uh, definitely uh, requires a, a second uh, edition uh, on how to, uh, we uh, are to respond to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, but that is probably a topic for another conference. Uh, in this one, uh, Professor Westermann uh, will be uh, speaking about the illusion of gold digging and interpretation of state practice. So Professor Westermann, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Panos, for your nice words and your invitation. Uh, I try to share the screen. I hope it will succeed because you never know uh, with techniques. Um, Yeah, you can see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, I will talk to uh, about the particular ways in which the so-called objective element state practice is uh, conceptualized and analyzed. Uh, and I think that uh, compared to the abundant literature on opinio juris, um, this, the investigation of state practice is a relatively neglected area. Um, as you know, and as it was already told a number, numerous times uh, before today, this morning, uh, there are two gateways to uh, customary international law. And I think it's more um, in clarifying to speak of these as two gateways and not as two elements. Because two elements suggest that you have two ingredient parts of customary international law, whereas of course we are speaking about gateways in the sense that we can have access to customary international law, that we can discover and find what it is. So it's more, I think, an epistemological uh, uh, thing than uh, an ontological thing, as, as is suggested by the term elements. So I would prefer to talk about two gateways. And uh, I th think it is remarkable the way how these two gateways, two epistemological uh, uh, approaches are conceptualized uh, usually. Uh, the first thing that, uh, uh, well, I talk about state practice, but of course, Judge Liu Lacoon is completely right. We can, it's better to talk about uh, general practice, uh, including that of non-state organizations, but I will refer to shorthand uh, as state practice. The only, the, 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 the way that it is state, uh, that uh, this epistemological gateway is conceptualized um, is dependent on three uh, assumptions. The first of it is that it is the aim of investigation of state practice is to identify the rules. The whole, uh, the, this is what uh, confused me uh, from the beginning when I got acquainted with this tricky law project, but also with the other uh, uh, abundant literature is that uh, it is generally thought that you have first to identify in order to interpret. So this will be one of the uh, 
uh, but you can you you hear it everywhere. The second thing is that uh, usually people talk about its object as mere facts, which I find is very uh, it's it's really a persistent uh, character trait. People talk about it, for instance, as uh, state practice as a mass of raw material or as a mass of raw data, as as Roberts uh, is a more more modern term. As, as something as a, a, a material uh, mass of uh, usages and so on so on so the factual character of what it is that is investigated is usually em emphasized and the third uh, related to the first two assumptions is that the method is and it is already said before today that the method is induction uh, it is uh, this investigation the first gateway the investigation is seen as a form of inductive reasoning, uh, an investigation of particular facts, uh, uh, which is thought to ascend, so to speak, to move upwards to general rules. Now, of course, nowadays nobody thinks uh, that this is a satisfactory picture, and I think that it is here that the popularity of opinio juris can uh, be accounted for, because that comes in as a second gateway, uh, second uh, possible access to uh, to customary international law, which is thought uh, can remove the inadequacies of the first gateway. So, opinion use is usually depicted as the counterpart of state practice. Uh, the aim is to interpret the rules. It says is said um, the interpretation that have of that which is formally identified, so to speak. Its object uh, is the norms, is not the facts, but the norm. And now, I in, in another article, I dealt with this uh, confusion con uh, concerning what is meant by norms. Because you can think, well, they, are they legal norms? Are they just normative things, uh, positions? Uh, that is uh, rather unclear. Um, are they meant as the prevailing, the dominant norms, the existing norms, or merely the desirable ideals? It's also not clear, but I will not deal with that kind of questions because I want now to uh, focus on the state practice part. So, but, so although it is surrounded by all sorts of confusions, um, I think it is clear that in any case, it is thought that the method that should be used is deduction. And uh, it's a, a descending method, uh, starting from general principles, maybe even ideals or whatever, or values, uh, going down to concrete rules. So the dominant idea is that these two gateways complement each other and should be added up to each other. Uh, the assumptions is of this, this additive theory uh, is nicely captured, I think, in the in the metaphor. I'm fond of metaphors always. I'm sorry for those who are not so visually inclined, but um, it's beautifully captured in the in the metaphor of gold digging, uh, where you can see it is uh, just a matter of digging, so to speak, in the rough and raw facts, as the sand and the clay, which is dug by this poor boy. And that uh, Pauline, sorry, yeah. uh, could you switch the uh, because we see just the first uh, slides still. Oh, yeah. Maybe if you press the the presentation. Uh... Yes, I did. I have this uh, as if it is still sharing. Uh, I will stop share now and uh, then I will start sharing again. Uh, it's still in the uh, in the two gateways. Yeah. So if you if you click on that on that, um, and now, simply, simply click on the next slide. Yeah, I have already. I see it uh, on my screen, but you don't see <laughs> it, which is uh, such a pity because of the nice pictures I had of this. Uh, gold digging things. Uh, um, let me uh, try to um, to ask my. It's terrible to ah, see. Ah, now now we can see it. Yeah, now yeah. we can see the uh, the states. Oh. We're now, now at. I don't yeah. see it anymore. But uh, that's strange. Uh, yeah, you can see it. We can see the state practice identifying CIL by induction and opinion juris interpreting CIL by deduction. Okay. Uh, 
you, so you, I think you've you've moved to the next one, to the fourth one, perhaps, uh, or are you because you were talking about gold digging? Yeah, but now I cannot see myself, which is very strange. Anyway, uh, I will try again. Ha! <sighs> it always happened. You see something? We see the uh, the, the gold digging uh, stuff. You see the gold digging. Yeah. No. Uh, I, I think you need to first go to the presenter mode and only then start sharing the screen. You're not in the presenter mode. You're just having a PowerPoint. Open. I have uh, the stop share. Uh, I, I, I am in the presenter mode, but I cannot see anything. So this is very strange. This doesn't help. Yeah. Can you see now? I see now. Um, we see it. Uh you see yeah. the poor one, boy one suggestion digging. is maybe you can tr yes we see the the poor boy digging. Poor if you're going to change the slide just just let us know so that we tell you if, if, if it has changed or not so this is what you have seen the uh, and now you see the boy is that is it that we, we see the boy and we see the sieve. Is that how it's called? Okay, you also see the sieve. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so, that's strange because I didn't see myself. I think I should uh, stop in. Uh, I, I, um, yeah. So that's very strange. It's not like synchronic with what you see. What I see is not. Syn is not uh, maybe the, the, the suggestion in, in, in the chat is that maybe you stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, use um, go to presentation mode without sharing uh, on the PowerPoint. Click click on present. Yeah. And then share it, or then either share the the entire screen. Can you see the entire screen now? Uh, we can see the same slide. Okay. Uh, let this. Let me just talk on. And uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, That's fine. I had this nice animation, uh, but uh, you. Yeah. Anyway, the state practice kind of uh, approach is seen as digging the ground and uh, sieving the sand and so on, and uh, the bringing upwards the raw material, so to speak. And uh, of course, then the 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 opinion juris is seen as a sort of a gold pan. Uh, the uh, sieving, which sieves the sand and the clay and uh, differentiates uh, the sand and the clay from the really important gold, gold uh, pieces of uh, customary international law. So, opinion euros is then conceived as a sort of filter to be applied after the digging, so to speak. Yeah? So, that is, I think, important to keep in mind. Well, I think that this uh, is a mistake that the analysis and interpretation of uh, customary international law is not like gold digging, so to speak. Uh, the, the problem is, where do we dig? Where do we dig? Uh, this is already a problem with actual gold digging, because, of course, uh, in order to find gold, you have at least to have one, some idea about where to lo look. You cannot dig everywhere. Uh, but in the case of customary international law, it's even harder because in, with gold, you know at least what, what you are looking for. And uh, what the customary international law is, you don't know. You don't know what it consists in. So in order to look, you have first to know what you are looking for. So in order to dig, you, know, you want to first to know what you're looking for. And this is, I think, the uh, very uh, uh, well-known problem of inductivism. Can you see my next slide now? Yes, yes, we can. I'm very glad. Uh, sorry for the animation, but so where to dig and also what what to dig. Um, this is the well-known problem of inductivism, which was analyzed, I think, thoroughly by epistemologists and the philosophers of science in the uh, previous century, and uh, who said, well, of course, in order to observe reality, you have first to know what you look for. Only then we can actually see things. And this is, of course, uh, exemplified in the well-known picture of this, well, what is it, of these dots and uh, lines, these black dots and lines. 
you can see that the dots and the lines in themselves, they don't tell you anything. They're just raw facts indeed and data. They derive their meaning from the fact from how they are ordered in a pattern. And of course, there are several possible patterns. Uh, you can see it as a rabbit, as you know, probably you are well known with this, familiar with this picture. You can see it as a rabbit or you can see it as a duck. And how you order the dots is dependent on your preconceptions, your ideas, your expectations. Uh, without uh, this kind of expectations, without background knowledge, I cannot even uh, see uh, in the mi microscope, I, I can only see as, as a, uh, someone who is not familiar with uh, biology, I can only see dots and colors and maybe an abstract painting, but I do not see the malignant tumor that the specialist sees in here. So without a lot of preconceptions, training and knowledge, uh, uh, we, can, we are not able to observe reality. So this is all pretty straightforward, but I think it also applies and even more so to the so-called facts of practices that we investigate uh, in, uh, as, as lawyers, because of course uh, there the background knowledge is indispensable. How can you make sense of all these gestures and conventions and, and resolutions and even if the word state is already a legal word, so how can you make sense of all that if you are departing from this blank uh, idea of that you don't know anything uh, about what you're looking for? So what you need and what is usually also applied, of course, is the sort of uh, uh, torchlight. Uh, oh. Can you see the next slide? Yes, we can. Oh, I'm so glad. So the torch uh, that appeared first in my, in my slide, uh, you have to have such a torch uh, in order to, um, make, to clarify that part of reality to, that is meaningful to you um, in order to see something. And it's only by means of such a torch that you are able to differentiate between the rules in the dark brown area which are thought uh, to be non-relevant uh, as merely uh, comity or expediency or etiquette or social rules or whatever, technical standards. And what is highlighted as the legally relevant part, those items that may count as precedents, so to speak. Without such a torchlight, you are not able to see anything. Of course, this is the same as in social and natural sciences. Also there, people use their theoretical searchlights. The only pro difference is that in law, in legal analysis, your theoretical searchlight is not an independent theory. For instance, in the sociology of law, you have a sociology, a sociological theory, and then you have the law. So the sociological theory and the law are different. You have the theory about relations, about social distance, control, etc. But they are different, so they are independent of each other. When you are dealing with doctrinal analysis, however, you use the very same concepts and rules uh, of the law itself in order to make sense of what you see there in state practice. In order, uh, uh, So the theoretical searchlight consists of all sorts of legal concepts and claims. And to, together they sort of form a web of all sorts of background uh, uh, preconceptions that weave uh, the, the, the rules together and which make it uh, uh, possible uh, to discern a pattern like the, the, the rabbit or the duck. So, only by means of this theoretical searchlight you can you are able to discern the pattern and the theoretical searchlight is the same is identical as what you are really investigating so the perspective and the object are so, so to speak the same identical and this is different from sociologists or psychological uh, analysis or, or uh, physics now, it is not necessary that these rules enjoy an indisputable uh, status, I think. 
they need not be unambiguously valid. It's never the case in, in, in international law, I think. But I think they should at least have a claim, a credible claim to legality. They should be considered as serious candidates to be uh, considered as, as relevant rules. Uh, in my view, the torch is nothing mysterious. It is just opinio juris, which is nothing more than an idea of what might count as a credible claim. This is, I think, uh, how we can make you, uh, sense of this uh, elusive notion. That means that in order to identify the rules, we should first uh, interpret the rules and assess their weight. And that's why we find ourselves in the, this endless treadmill of the so-called hermeneutical circle. I hope you can see the circle in your... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the hermeneutical circle, which is, I think, unavoidable if you engage in interpretation, whether it's literary interpretation or legal or whatever, but in which the facts and the rules are so-called mutually independent, uh, in interdependent, so they constitute each other, so to speak. So you cannot see identification as such, uh, without uh, presupposing interpretation of what you are expecting to find. And that means that what you are expecting to find is filtered by opinio juris uh, and that you are running in circles all the time. However, I think there is one characteristic and that is my last slide, uh, which makes it a little bit different. Uh, from the usual hermeneutical, hermeneutical circles that lawyers and uh, literary uh, analysts uh, walk. And that is that I think that opinio juris counts twice. Uh, first, uh, it, you, it, they, it singles out which conventions and which usages and which rules may count as relevant precedents, which may count as relevant part of state practice and after having identified identified state practice in this way it plays its role a second time as well by saying that only that relevant state practice should be filtered again uh, by again opinion yours so it determines what counts as relevant state practice and it determines what counts as custom international law which is of course doing this, uh, walking this hermeneutical circle twice. Of course, it is not in, in oh, it would be ridiculous if we, if we would make that explicit. And usually the analysis is carried out in one big sweep uh, where the opinion jurist informs the whole circle. Um, so uh, I would say uh, opinion viewers plays a role before state practice can be identified. Typical rules are interpreted as more or less promising. State practice is therefore not a neutral, objective, solid ground that is usually depicted in the literature uh, and that is only subsequently interpreted, interpreted. It is, I would say, even the other way around, without opinion viewers it is not possible to speak of state practice. Thank you for your attention and apologies for this strange uh, uh, sharing screen problems that I had uh, because I like to have this animated version, but uh, nevertheless, I hope you can, could follow my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, this was really very, very interesting and don't worry about the, the animation. Uh, uh, if you send us the uh, the PowerPoint uh, when we upload the video, we'll make sure that we substitute it with the, with the proper uh, animation. I'm making promises on behalf of uh, my my poor uh, student assistant who will have to do that. <laughs> but uh, I take that prerogative. Uh, a little bit. My apologies, Conrad, for that. Uh, thank you very much, Pauline. It was it was very interesting, and I uh, I have to say, I think I've said to uh, to you before that originally when we started talking about interpretation of customer international law, we thought that we were basically on opposite ends of the spectrum. And the more the years pass, and the more we are dealing and discussing with this, uh, gradually we, we were starting converging and thinking, no, 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 we're not. We're 
kind of in agreement. There are still some places, uh, but I think that within two years, I think we'll be in complete harmony uh, at that uh, point. Um, and this is an interesting point that, that you raise. I mean, the, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, this presentation was a love letter to opinion juris, basically, on, on how important opinion juris is compared to, to, to state practice. And you raise a very interesting point because uh, most of the times also this double counting, uh, the, the double counting that you raise is, is raised more that the same actions are considered both state practice and opinion juris, but you raise also a, a kind of a, a different version that the opinion juris kind of examine state practice and affects us in, in, in a double way. So there's a double counting in a completely different uh, scenario. It explains the double counting yeah. which is mentioned in the literature. Yeah. It is yeah. inevitable that you double count the resolutions and, and, the, and the declarations and so on. So I think there's there's plenty to, to unpack here uh, when we have the, the Q&A. Uh, but now we'll move on to, to our uh, second uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Eleni Micha, uh, who currently holds a teaching post at the School of Law of the University of Athens. And she's also a visiting lecturer at the Frederick University in uh, Cyprus. Uh, also uh, a guest researcher here at the University of Groningen in the context of Turkey law, and a regular member of the ILA committee uh, and an attorney at law specializing in human rights litigation. Uh, Dr. Micha will be uh, presenting on custom dynamics and the interpretation exercise. So Dr. Micha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Panos, for the introduction. So uh, let's see if I'm more uh, fortunate than Pauline in sharing some few <laughs> slides. Um, Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Hopefully. So. Yeah, we can see the second slide now. Okay. This is lovely. So, um, instead of um, an introduction, traditional introduction, uh, this is the quotation by Agatha Christie in her most famous novel, The ABC Murders, where she wrote that the spoken words and the written words, there is an astonishing gulf between them. So there is a way of turning sentences that completely reverses the meaning. And of course, I'm sure that um, we all uh, can understand that Agatha Christie uh, couldn't have in her mind uh, customer international law when uh, she was writing the ABC murders. But nevertheless, um, this is a correct assessment uh, because uh, customer international law is an unwritten, um, is an unwritten law and can't be misinterpreted since uh, its meaning is volatile as we have already discussed. Uh, from the beginning. Uh, however, uh, this lack of stability and certainty that um, customer international law presented first sight is not al always fatal, I think, um, for the survival and effective application of customer international law norms. On the contrary, I will argue that such, uh, such a situation may prove to be under, of course, certain circumstances, rewarding for the development and evolution of the entire uh, customer international law. So uh, I will proceed to examine. Is it okay with the yep, uh, yep, second? That's fine. Okay. Lovely. Um, I'll proceed to examine two main questions. And of course, these are particular uh, issues. Uh, the two main questions are um, how customer international law as a set of socially constructed tools operates within the international community in accordance with natural law principles. Although customer international law as such, it doesn't have um, it doesn't contain physical first principles and axioms and known fundamental equations as the uh, existing uh, mathematical uh, logic. Uh, and the second question is uh, if and how 
the interpretation of customer international law performed uh, by international courts and tribunals operates in favor of the evolution of uh, custom. And as the case study, um, as a case study for this um, uh, questions, I uh, shall examine uh, the interlocutor decision by the Special Tribunal for Lebanon on the Ayash case uh, regarding uh, the definition and interpretation of the crime of terrorism as an international crime. So to, uh, to combine uh, all these um, questions and issues, customary international law will be perceived as a social complex system according to systems theory, uh, which are, and the social dynamics of it, uh, which are interconnected. And uh, as the custom is developed uh, within an intricate environment, uh, that of the international uh, society. Now, the question is, um, by now, which are the elements of the system? How this social complex system is uh, shaped? Um, this system, as uh, I perceive it, um, is, contains the states, non-state actors, other non-state actors, um, international organizations, and mostly uh, General Assembly and the Security Council of uh, the UN, and of course, the international judiciary, um, when it undertakes to apply these norms, rules, and principles, we'll see how this is going to be. So these are the basic components of uh, the customer international law system, which um, are interacting uh, one with the other, and they form as they say, a concrete acting living system. This system, in this system, um, how it operates, it operates through different variables. And the variables according to um, systems theory are needs and properties uh, that allow the social system to operate. And we have there sort of all sorts of variables, um, either time, space, or distance, or uh, the level of a population, uh, it, it depends. But mostly for co um, customer international law system, uh, the flow of information between the different components is essential in order to grab how this uh, system will work. Um, of course, uh, in our area, of discussion, and especially within the premises of international criminal law, uh, legal certainty, effectiveness, and the legality principle uh, are basic uh, variables um, for, for the system. So effective interpretation, to that end, effective interpretation um, can operate as such a variable. To the extent that it can change, and it will change, custom dynamics, uh, as it is, it will be evidenced through uh, the case, the decision of the Special Tribunal uh, for Lebanon. Uh, such changes between the components of the system, um, depend, depending um, on the feedback that the system itself gets within its components or outside of the system. And even if this feedback is a delayed one. For example, such a case we have when there is a subsequent state practice according to Article um, 313B of the Vienna Convention, um, which constitute a delayed feedback uh, to the action of states. And the same goes for the absence um, of uh, state reaction. Uh, let's uh, go on. 
let's see if, uh, okay. This is the idea of social dynamics and within the government, how they work within the complex um, system. Um, and you can see it um, more um, here. So, if we, if we have a little bit clarified how this interrelation can work within such a complex uh, social system as uh, the customer international law is, uh, we have to bear in mind that complexity has to do with tensions and strains within the components of the system. Or, as I told you, uh, having a feedback from outside of the system. But it is not at all certain that such a system, uh, having all these strains, um, will collapse as part of the doctrine argues. And uh, I have to, to, to make a certain clarification here. Complex systems as originated uh, from the natural sciences are not always self-organizing systems, as they say, reaching a critical point, um, uh, critical state of point behavior. Uh, this happens, this criticality situation happens, arrives only in closed systems. Um, social systems, even the complex ones, um, are not uh, closed, they're open. And so um, input and output to and fro uh, from the system can really is strain and tensions between its components. Um, the flow information, all this input and output uh, to and from the system, uh, can be um, materialized through uh, various ways. Uh, you can have um, uh, a new uh, judgment, a new state practice uh, adopted from the states, a certain policy regarding uh, the adoption of um, foreign, um, such a foreign policy. And such a case has happened when the UK um, adopted the legal memorandum in 2013 uh, regarding, let me see, uh, here it is. Uh, this is a part of the legal memorandum uh, regarding the chemical weapons uh, used by Syria and the answer um, of the UK along, of course, uh, with the um, United States and France, the armed um, attack to uh, Syria. So the forcible measures undertaken. Such a case um, was adoption of a certain foreign policy, uh, which acted um, as uh, an inflow uh, within the system. Now, uh, in such open systems, the permeability of boundaries uh, is of crucial importance in order to examine if and how a complex social system can adapt to its environment or this perplexed environment effectively so that it can relieve strains and tensions. To that point, uh, understanding uh, the concept of entropy is fundamental in order to comprehend how, how, excuse me, how uh, such uh, social systems react to information flow and how the system change and eventually are going to evolve without, of course, collapsing to a, a chaos. Uh, so, and through entropy, uh, we can also find out whether these changes can be reversible or irreversible within uh, a society. Okay. Uh, entropy in natural uh, sciences represent, to put it very, very simply, it's not so simply, but anyway, I'll try to make it. 
um, represents the number of ways uh, that the system can uh, rearrange itself. So, for example, you take an ice cube, and when we put the ice cube next to the fireplace, it will, of course, melt. This is an irreversible situation since the melted water cannot turn to ice uh, again back uh, without uh, a great change to occur. So, the system is not balanced within its environment according to um, the natural uh, laws of uh, physics. And it is often claimed that such entropy in nature uh, operates as a, uh, as a measure of disorder and chaos. And that goes also for complex social system. And for um, those um, are in favor of entropy in uh, social sciences, um, argue that low entropy means that uh, society is in a state of order and continues to be. Otherwise, high entropy means that the social system gradually declines into a state of disorder and may decay. But beware, because the social system cannot uh, um, as customer international law uh, cannot be disordered or destroyed um, according to the uh, natural um, to the rules of the natural law because real life and social life cannot be equated um, with the same principles and the same content. But if this is not possible, um, we wonder whether and how, if and how, entropy can be of a use to a legal system. And I will argue that it is of a use to a legal system, not in the way uh, that it has been um, maintained, but uh, in a way that indirectly, perhaps, and involuntarily, uh, the Special uh, Tribunal for Lebanon uh, ha uh, has already done it. So uh, let's see the three main, um, the three main points that uh, the inter interlocutory decision of the Special Tribunal has come up to. Uh, the three main lines of reasoning for the court was first that rules of customary and international law can be interpreted, and they can be interpreted in accordance with the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties. Since these rules are of a customary international law character also. And uh, this is, of course, the expert of, uh, of the decision. Then the second principle uh, that the court uh, arrived to is that the interpretation process uh, that the court applies is a constructive one. And uh, it's a constructive one because it is based on the contextual mode of interpretation so much within its internal scope as it is in external scope. And uh, for the court, this approach, this interpretative approach, corresponds to the reality of a dynamic society which changes over time. And this is most important because uh, in this way, uh, not only the system of customary international law does not arrive in destroying itself, uh, but on the contrary, it leads to its progressive development and therefore to its evolution. The third keynote principle um, is, of course, the legality principle and um, um, the prohibition of retro retroactive application of uh, international uh, criminal law. The court went on to clarify that the progressive 
the pet here it is okay uh, the progressive development of the law does not preclude the application of the legality principle since courts will eventually adjust their decision to the change of the social circumstances in a given case. Uh, so uh, the special tribunal made it clear that such cases, in such cases, there can be no uncertainty of the law, provided, of course, uh, that the development was foreseeable. So speaking again in entropy terms, the approach of the courts leads again to entropy reduction and the development, of course, of the law. So in order to conclude, and I hope I'm not very much overdue. Uh, oh, you still have one to two minutes uh, more. OK, so that's, that's lovely. Uh, so in order to conclude, let's relax a little bit. My idea, my main idea is this. Is the interpretative approach of customary international law, which of course uh, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon adopted, uh, is a low character entropian mode of interpretation? Can we call it um, uh, with this uh, perplexed sound name? Uh, for me, um, this is evident uh, from the court's legal reasoning in an extensive, of course, uh, decision, which um, is for 153 pages almost, uh, if I remember, uh, my memory serves me well. Uh, since uh, the court said, uh, this is an entropian mode of interpretation, since this is a construction with a view to give consistency, homogeneity, and due weighting uh, to the uh, different elements of the diverging um, rule regarding, of course, the crime of terrorism. So, following this legal reasoning of the court, the elements of a complex system like customary international law make the necessary connections and uh, fill in the gap for uh, lack of predictability. And if I may add um, the newest developments to this, um, then the in the terminacy of uh, customary legal rules, it has been argued that such indeterminacy can be also quantified, not only qualified, but also quantified, uh, especially through the use of artificial intelligence. Of course, this is a very, very recent development, and um, it remains to be seen whether such a stage of interpretative approach will be a success in reducing uncertainties within uh, customary international law norms. And um, of course, it all depends uh, from the variables used within the system, the components of the system we use, and uh, which are the feedbacks, uh, the inputs and outputs within the system. Um, this is my conclusion, I hope, uh, and I'm waiting for uh, stimulating comments in case I have been clear enough uh, in this perplexing and complex uh, world of um, social uh, systems. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mika, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, Anybody who uses entropy is always good in my book. Uh, uh, also because you raised some interesting points about how 
natural sciences and social sciences uh, differently, well, should perceive differently the, the idea of entropy. Uh, this reminded me uh, as well of, of Serge Sur's uh, reference to interpretation of customer international law, where he kind of said that the interpretation of customer international law has a kind of a negentropic, so a reverse entropy uh, kind of uh, function. Yes. I'd really like to hear your thoughts on that uh, when we have the discussion. Uh, but it also tied um, uh, the uh, the case that you mentioned also ties very well uh, with what uh, His Excellency Judge Liu Jiakun mentioned in the uh, in his keynote speech about this taking the normative environment, the external context, uh, and how that helps also kind of uh, the systemic kind of interpretation helps uh, stabilize uh, the uh, potentially stabilize uh, the system. And I think this also ties very well to to, to our next uh, speaker's uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Craig uh, Eggett, who's uh, assistant professor of international law at Maastricht uh, University. Uh, Craig's current research uh, interests include evidentiary questions before international courts, the role of courts and tribunals in international law making. And Craig is the convener of the Maastricht International Law Discussion Group. And his PhD research focuses on the nature and functions of general principle of law in the international uh, legal system. And I think prompted by that, uh, his topic is gonna be on general principles uh, of law and particularly general principles of law and the interpretation of custom. So Craig, or is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Firstly, I, I would like to say thank you very much to all the organisers. Um, I'm very happy to be here. The, the Plural Courts and the, the Tricky Law Projects are, are what I think are particularly excellent features of, of, of international law um, scholarship, and I'm really happy to be uh, discussing these, these thorny questions. Um, as, as was mentioned in that introduction, I am, I am not a customary law scholar. I am very much on the outside. And in a way, my topic is very much on the outside here, but also in a way from what we've heard already today, uh, it's not. Uh, I hope that many of the things that I'm talking about, uh, I believe that many of the things that I'm, I'm talking about are very much the same features and dynamics and issues as discussed by, um, uh, by the previous panelists and, and by His Excellency in the opening remarks. I was actually very happy to hear references uh, to general principles in His Excellency's opening remarks. It's nice that these norms get such top billing um, in, uh, in a conference about customary law. Um, essentially, my objective today is to consider the, the processes, the features, the, the dynamics, to use all these, these, these other words, um, of customary international law interpretation from the perspective of general principles of law. Um, basically, can these norms, can these general principles of law in any way help address these very difficult and thorny questions of interpreting custom? I think uh, to preempt this and judging by what we've heard already, I think the answer is hopefully at least a cautious yes. Um, now, I I'll proceed in, in essentially three main parts. The first is, I think, to clarify what exactly I mean by general principles. Uh, I think that's quite important given how nebulous and vague these can be uh, a lot of the time. Um, second, then I want to talk about the role of general principles as part of this architecture of the interpretation of general principles, as being part of the building blocks for the rules, guidance, principles, whatever it is you want to call them. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'll turn to the question of custom, general principles, and systemic interpretations. This is where we obviously we return to coherence uh, and interpreting these things together. I think what, what Dr. Mika's pr presentation just now on um, uh, it very much touches on this. You know, we're trying to um, to interpret this, referring to the, the social dynamics and the system dynamics. I think general principles and custom are very much linked to the systematicity of international law. We'll come to that in a second. Um, I do want to say, uh, uh, before I go on to those two things, firstly, in terms of general principles, I am talking about general principles in the sense of Article 38.1c of the ICJ statute. Now, I say that, I think that's an important clarification to make because it's a rather rhetoric device. You know, you can shout at something and say it's a general principle and it adds, it adds value to it, but I'm talking about this very specific dynamic here. And while I think, um, uh, while I would if, if I have time, refer to, for example, in international criminal law, Article 21, and, and that reference to, to general principles, that's a very different one to what I'm talking about in Article 38.1c. Um, so the second initial comment I want to make is that, as I said, I hope to be talking about many of the same things, 
uh, and, and talking about many of the same dynamics and issues that people have been, been speaking about. Much of what I might say might sound like a bit of a pointless battle for terminology. Um, I hope that's not the case. Um, but I do think that that's an extremely important thing to do, is to have this battle and this clarification of, of terminology when you're approaching such a, a daunting task as tricky law uh, is of, of trying to map these um, features of interpreting these, these unwritten norms. Okay, so I'll turn now to this first point, uh, general principles, and I want to make two assertions uh, with general principles. Before I, I, I turn to those, I think it's important to note that uh, general principles are, are very much the, the left out element of Article 38 uh, 1. Um, there's been some resurgence and some in, you know, heightened interest in these norms, certainly in the last few years. I'm sure you're all aware they're on the program of work of the International Law Commission. There have been some excellent uh, monographs and, and edited volumes, and some people in this, this conference I know have written some, um, and I've read extensively, some excellent things by some people who are on our program over the next two days on general principles. Despite that, I think it would be fair to say, and I hope you'd all agree, that of the three sources listed in Article 38.1, General principles are, are overlooked and, and understood. Um, think to, I'm sure, any of your uh, lectures you, you, you give in your tutorials on the sources of international law. You have a detailed discussion of the VCLT. Uh, we talk about state practice and opinion areas. We go through North Sea Continental Shelf. We mention in a breath that general principles are, exist, and then we go on to talk about state responsibility or something else, I'm sure. Perhaps I'm, uh, I'm oversimplifying that, and I would welcome anyone to say, no, I spend ages talking about general principles. I'd be very happy to hear that. Even in my courses, that's unfortunately how it goes. Um, now, I think when, when all of us, as we know, as lawyers or social scientists or anything else, we approach every topic on a set of presumptions, assumptions, and biases. Uh, we all do this. I, I will try to articulate some of these in my understanding of general principles. Now, I want to make two assertions, as I said. The first is that there is a very clear distinction between general principles in the sense of Article 38 and principles in the strict sense or the true sense of the term. Um, now, essentially, and I hope I don't raise too many eyebrows when I say this, despite the labels as general principles of law, it's very much like a guinea pig being uh, not a pig, not from Guinea. This is uh, general principles are, are not principles of law. They are uh, rules uh, in the sense of Article 38.1. They are very distinct from principles in the true sense of the word. A principle like solidarity or sovereignty, if these are principles, or humanity or legality, is very different from the invocation of norms under Article 38, which, in my view, tends to be a far more technical reference to typically secondary rules, such as rules of evidence, potentially such as rules of interpretation, rules on jurisdiction, etc. Essentially, the, the function of the norms, the structure of the norms, uh, is inherently different. Um, to refer to some general jurisprudential, uh, terms here, general principles, like all rules, are these definitive commands. Uh, they have conditions and consequences. They apply in this all or nothing fashion. Principles in the strict sense are optimization commands. They are value-based, pull in a particular direction, but might not necessitate a particular outcome. There's an extremely close link between general principles and principles, just like I think there is between custom and principles but they are a distinct um, category of norms in my view. This, I think, is supported not only by the drafting of the PCIJ statute, but also by the invocation before courts and tribunals. States and courts uh, do not, uh, when referring to Article 38 in the limited times they do, do not refer to things like sovereignty and to things like equality uh, and various other principles. They refer to very technical secondary rules and they try to evidence those on the basis of, of, of uh, various different things, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, the second point an assertion I want to make is I think very linked to um, the views of custom that, that might have been uh, elaborated so far. Uh, and that is that general principles are ascertained in a broader and a more inclusive process of lawmaking by what I and, and others, it's not a term I've come up with, I've borrowed this, uh, I, I term systemic officials. Um, now, essentially, I use this term more inclusively. This is not merely states. And I think the reality of general principles is that they come into formation through the reasoning of international courts and tribunals. They do much of the heavy lifting here. Um, 
Obviously, we discount the, the, the clearly unhelpful and inappropriate phrase civilized nations in Article 38. We're then left with recognition. The question is recognition by whom? The ILC has said recognition by the community of nations. And in its work, strongly suggested that it is states that do lots of this heavy lifting. I think that that is simply not the case. It's simply not the reality of these norms. Um, I, I refer to the process of formation of general principles as one of contestation and confirmation. Arguments are made um, uh, and, and sources of evidence are referred to, and these norms are confirmed, sometimes very quickly supported, sometimes they develop over a longer period of time. Now, I am fully aware that my uh, elaboration there on what general principles might be might considerably overlap with what many of you, how many of you view the formation of custom international law. Now, I don't necessarily want to go into that, but I perfectly um, think that there's something to be said if I'm not oversimplifying the presentations of Professor Westerman and Dr. Mika, that essentially you are challenging this very rigid, traditional doctrinal understanding of state practice plus opinion years equals, and this very basic elaboration of this, and trying to see, you know, in reality more what does this involve. Uh, I, I think that this is, is, is very much needed and very much welcome. Um, Yet I would say, and again, I'm aware I'm speaking to a, a, a crowd of, of customer international enthusiasts, I would say that we perhaps too readily refer to customer international law whenever we're referring to something that is not a treaty. We have this almost intuitive um, gut reaction to say, well, it's not a treaty, it's part of international, I know that, therefore it's custom. I think we have to be a little careful with that. I, of course, acknowledge uh, customs, uh, you know, crucial role in international law, um, and I think it's extremely important, and it deserves the the level of academic attention that it is is getting in in projects such as tricky law. Um, but I think we should be a little careful sometimes uh, when examining some norms and seeing exactly how they would fit. Um, I, and I would say I probably adopt a slightly narrow role of the kinds of norms. Uh, they tend to be, in my view, primary rules of international law that are custom. But I'm sure we can come to that and you can all tell me how, how wrong and, and misleading uh, and misled I am on, on that topic. Now, um, that's the, the basic understanding of, of general principles I have. They are rules of international law, um, autonomous category of rules that exist in an anarchical relationship alongside treaties and custom. They can, uh, just like treaties and custom, there can be parallel rules of, of, of general principles, etc. So now my question essentially turns to the second element, which is when talking about the, the norms, the ideas, the guidance, all these terms, which I'll come to in a second, for interpreting customary rules, so actually interpreting whatever the process is, interpreting these customary rules, when they are formed, um, and again, this is presupposing perhaps a too artificial definition between ascertainment and interpretation, which I'm, I'm aware, of course, with unwritten rules is not such a clean distinction, but basically how can general principles of law, if at all, feature as part of this? What makes up this architecture of, of interpretation and how could these general principles play a part here? So, um, in my uh, certainly not extensive survey of the literature on this, um, uh, the terms used to describe how what regulates interpretation of custom, I found several rules, principles, methods, maxims, guidelines, approaches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, again, not wishing to in too much get into the trenches of, of terminological warfare, but to simply say, when we're talking about these terms, what I think is an important thing to, to distinguish between are, are concrete rules of interpretation. It's just started, I think, hailing or snowing or raining here in The Hague, so hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, so basically these norms that require an interpreter to do X, Y, or Z. Now that's not necessarily saying to reach a particular outcome, but requiring the interpreter to take into account A, to start with X, then you may turn to Y only if X fails, then you may turn to Z only if Y fails. Um, they impose certain uh, obligations, they imp impose certain um, definitive commands on the interpreter. 
Um, my uh, intuition, and again, I'm again mindful of the audience here, is that these are relatively few and far between. I believe His Excellency said, uh, and a few others said, you can you know, take any and all means that you 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 need when interpreting uh, these. So I think that's that that's uh, maybe a, a smaller role. Uh, and then there's these uh, non-definitive, these these general things of guidance. They might be under labels like maxim. Um, certain principles we have to take into account to, to keep things in mind, um, and they they might shape our approach to interpretation, but they do not impose these specific um, obligations. Now, one thing I do want to mention is um, I think maybe I'll be fighting against the tide of your understanding of general principles here. Um, Many, many people, uh, when thinking of maxims of interpretation, uh, I know in the work of some of the, the, the tricky law, um, some of the excellent work, I should say, of the, the, the tricky law authors, is there's lots of reference uh, to, to maxims. And of course, Latin raises its head here uh, again and again. We have these seemingly authoritative Latin phrases. Uh, they come from, from domestic law or, or, or just this inherent to the idea of a system. Um, these might be sometimes viewed as general principles. I do want to clarify that a lot of the time on my understanding, these, these won't be. Uh, these would uh, elaborate on a principle of a general idea, but not in the sense of Article 38.1c. Once again, general principles, in my understanding, are rules. So then could there be general principles of the interpretation uh, of custom or interpretation of law in general? Now, I think the answer to that is probably yes. Um, of course, we've already heard reference to Article 31, uh, 32 and 33, but I'll focus, uh, I think, mostly on 31 of the VCLT. I think it's, um, you know, we don't, we can look far, far beyond the ICJ to many other courts and tribunals and domestic law uh, uh, judicial bodies to see reference to these, to this norm. This is clearly part, unequivocally part of international law for treaties. Uh, I, I think we can also, also say um, probably and very strongly, uh, we can say that this is uh, part uh, in general for the interpretation of customer international law, although I'll leave that to others to, to flesh out. Um, what I want to say here is that I think there's quite a strong argument to be made that this, these, these rules on interpretation uh, do not anchor themselves in the practice of states or opinion euros states. Uh, they instead find their grounding in the reasoning of courts and tribunals, in ideas that are just inherent to law, in ideas of domestic law, They've become part of the international law system, not because states do them, but because they are um, inherently um, legitimate. I'll say that word mindful of the, the Privy Courts uh, individuals here as well. Uh, they are inherently attractive. They've been supported by courts and tribunals and various other actors by the ILC, by international organizations. Um, and once again, I go back to what was said in the first presentation. I think if you uh, are, are challenging and and, and um, you know, engaging with the elements of custom, you might say that they fall within the elements of custom, but I, I think you could make an argument that these are general principles uh, of international law. Like I said, I think there are some others there um, that we could say in the architecture of interpretation that follow not from the actions of states, but from courts and tribunals, academic commentary, the ILC, et cetera, such as the idea um, that an interpretation cannot com conflict with use Kogan's. Um, this logically follows from use Kogan's and the idea of use Kogan's is just us connecting the dots there uh, to impose this additional duty. And as I said, this idea that there is a hierarchy, if there is, and that's of course something to be fleshed out, or, or an order or a process that we must follow in certain situations or, or, or generally when dealing with questions of interpretation. Um, I think I'll probably leave that there uh, for this point, and I'll turn to my the final of my uh, um, elements of my my presentation, which is custom, general principles, and systemic interpretation. And I start this very mindful of the identity of the chair of this panel, and I'll be very careful in my uh, observations here. Um, I think there's a very strong uh, claim to be made for this idea that the rule on systemic interpretation is a general principle. Uh, my idea of general principles, and I think this refers back to the previous presentation, is very much linked to the systematicity of law. It's very much linked to the systematicity of international law and the general social dynamics of that system. Um, 
Uh, I think, again, an argument might be made that this is a customary rule, yet, um, I, I, and one thing I do want to say on this, I should have mentioned this earlier, by the way, of course, we're referring quite a lot of the time to judicial decisions as evidence of custom, which of course we can, yet I, I think we should also be very mindful that in judicial decisions, um, quite a lot of the time, of course not all the time, the actual elaboration of, and the reasoning as to why this uh, a rule is custom is, is seldom clear, if at all um, present. Um, so I think when we look at the origins and the inherent attractiveness and the position and the, the value that, that many at attach to systemic interpretation, it seems to ground its membership, to me at least, in international law um, uh, on the basis of more than just the, the, the practice of states. Um, it's so this this beauty and this feature of international law is so linked to the idea of this systemic fabric of international law that I think it it suggests characteristic as a general principle. Now the final thing I want to turn around, turn to is um, this idea of reference to general principle as part of to general principles as part of the um, as part of systemic interpretation. So in this reference to other relevant rules of international law, can we make reference to general principles? Now, I think the answer to that is, is very clearly yes, if you understand general principles as rules of international law, as I do. Now, the difficulty here is that we have to figure out what that general principle of law, what those prospective general principles of law are before we can actually start referring to them to interpret other rules. Uh, this, I hope, will become easier as the attention given to general principles continues to grow and we continue to have a greater understanding of these norms. But I think that there is some evidence of reference to these um, general principles in the work of, uh, in the, the decisions of courts and tribunals. Um, and I, and I, my plea here essentially is that when engaging in this interpretation uh, exercise, to, to not forget general principles of law, I think is essentially the, the, the essence of my, my claim here. Uh, like I said, I think there are perfectly uh, logical, convincing arguments to be made where, where general principles adopt a more marginal role. I think given the amount of time I've dedicated to general principles, I couldn't possibly bring myself to, to adopt those, but I think they're perfectly, perfectly logical. As a, as a final word, I want to say that I think if we pay more attention to general principles. If we, um, we further consider these, consider these, there's potential for these to have a role as a tool in contributing to coherence, um, which I think the inter exercise of interpretation is absolutely critical um, if this is going to be achieved. Uh, I might have gone a little bit over time, so my apologies, but thank you, thank you very much. I hope that was clear. Crystal clear, uh, Craig, and actually right on time, so no need to to, to apologize uh, preemptively uh, for that. Thank you very much for uh, for the very interesting uh, presentation, and I, I have to admit that I, I must hang my head in shame because I'm one of those people, as you said, that uh, goes a lot in detail on, on treaties and customary international law, and then in the classes, general principles, unfortunately, uh, takes, uh, you know, uh, it is analyzed, but not in so much uh, detail. Although I, I'm, I'm trying to do better, and I promise after this, I'll, I'll try and do much, much, much better uh, in that uh, scenario. Um, very interesting the uh, the things that that you mentioned about uh, as well about uh, the interpretation especially of customer international law and, and other roles as being essential to to, to the functioning of, of of the whole system as being absolutely necessary for them to to exist and this reminds me a lot uh, uh, Ancelotti uh, argued this and he basically referred to, he called them constructive rules, essentially the, the rules of the game. So, uh, you know, you need certain rules to exist there in order to be able to, to play the game uh, properly. He didn't elaborate that, that much on it, but that might be uh, one thing. But I'm, I'm not going to uh, abuse uh, my, my, uh, my power as chair at this point any longer. Um, I'll open the floor uh, to questions to all our uh, wonderful panelists. And I will give a few minutes so the audience can uh, write their questions in the Q&A. And we already have one uh, question. 
uh, by Karem Luisa Cardenas uh, Infanson, uh, if I pronounce it properly. And this question is for, for, for Professor Westerman, uh, how to deal with this apparent contradiction between the widespread idea that customer international law is general universal and the fact that actually depends on the background knowledge of the person slash institution making the determination and interpretation. Is there also a role for the legitimacy or weight we give to that decision? Well, I think that the answer to that question is very well uh, uh, given by the other two uh, panelists. I mean, it is not uh, the, the the court itself is not uh, acting on its own. It's uh, also not uh, it's weighing uh, the, the various uh, relevant uh, rules and principles uh, not by uh, by its own. It is um, it's it's dealing with a, an entire web of background knowledge which. Uh, it, it, which is the basis for interpreting a state practice. So I would say it is, uh, it is not uh, objective uh, in the hard, solid sense, sent, um, sense of the word that is usually uh, given to, to this objective element, but it's not for that reason subjective of, or arbitrary. It is, uh, so I think that the, the two other contributions make that abundantly clear. Uh, it, is a, it is figuring in a system uh, which uh, makes for, for the, well, it, it sort of constrains the discretion. Uh, and uh, I, I'm completely uh, in agreement with the last speaker as well, that of course these principles are the very basis of what makes a legal system possible. So, and I would say it, it is a, a misunderstanding to see these th three sources as things as entities so to speak uh, so the, the general principles uh, note an activity uh, it is it is the uh, the activities rather than entities so as soon as you see the sources as entities as sort of containers then then you are thinking of oh is it objective or subject no no it is not necessary this dichotomy uh, you can sur uh, I hope that this is an answer. I cannot see your face, so uh, I don't see any confusion. Thank you very much, Pauline, uh, for that. Um, of course, if any of the other speakers, uh, Dr. Micha or uh, uh, Dr. Eggett, you want to jump in and add anything, feel free to do so. Yeah, Dr. Micha. Well, uh, I, took, I took a um, the, um, the initiative. So, uh, Greg, thank you so much. <laughs> it was uh, um, lovely and stimulating. Let me ask you about, uh, of course, your um, argument that general principles are formed by, not by states, of course, like the custom, as, uh, but from international um, uh, courts and tribunals. So do you mean to say, and I have, um, in my mind, the example of the legality principle, of course, which the International Criminal Court said that it's a general principle of international law, which uh, is derived by the jurisprudence of national courts. So for you, it's the same um, idea for all general principles that they can be derived by the jurisprudence of national courts. and. How do you um, how do you make an assessment of such um, of the identity of a general principle? Shall I go ahead and, and answer straight away? Yes, please do. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think the last bit cut out, but I think I managed to get everything that you said there. Thanks very much for for the question. This is, of course an extremely thorny issue and was by far the largest chapter of my, my PhD thesis was dealing with this question of, of how do you identify the, these, these norms. Now, a first thing, um, the legality principle as such, I would say is probably not a general principle of law as I understand it, it is a principle of law. And I know this sounds ridiculous to say the same word again and again and try to draw a distinction um, in the sense that as such, it probably isn't a rule that contains obligations. It might, and there could be certain legality related obligations um, or rights, uh, and they would be general principles. Now, indeed, courts and tribunals have done this quite a bit. Um, 
scholars tend to place the emphasis on domestic law, right? So let's have it, let's rummage through, we go back to the sort of gold digging uh, metaphor, looking at the, the grand wall of potential legal norms. And we're there with our very rudimentary tools, hacking away, hoping we find something relevant, right? Um, now, this, this my, my, my approach basically is that there are certain factors and pieces of evidence that could contribute to the existence of a general principle. Domestic law could absolutely be one of these. So could reference to principles in the true sense of the term. Uh, other international instruments could be part of this, including treaties, although I think we have to be a little bit careful with that, but, and also soft law, the actions of international organizations, previous decisions of courts and tribunals. There's a range of evidence. That's just a, a few of the things I think there. What is key is that the, the official um, or whichever, whichever actor is, is doing it at the time, I suppose, is, is um, but I would say it is, the, the official is, is central and it's usually going to be courts and tribunals here. The question is, is there an international rule? Does this evidence lead to the conclusion that there is an international rule here? Now, I think this reality is, this is the reality in courts and tribunals in my view, and this reflects something that is sometimes a little bit difficult for us to say as international lawyers, is that courts and tribunals have a role in lawmaking. Um, and I would say have a very significant role in lawmaking. We've heard the word precedent a few times already today, which when I was taught international law was a very dirty word to say in an international law classroom. Um, but that's how it works. At the very least, international courts and tribunals have authority that require you need to deal with them. You need to deal with this decision. But I think probably more accurately, I mean, in our classes, we're referring, I mean, the, the vast majority of our PIL class is basically saying the word Nicaragua again and again until the students start to understand these basic rules of international law, right? Uh, or in the context of, of um, international criminal law, His Excellency already referred to Tadic. I mean, it, it's so monumental. You have to deal with this. It has such authority, it has such a consequence. So I think you're looking for whether there's an international rule. Uh, and that's what the the the, um, the courts do. I think we need to be a bit careful with reference to domestic law because sometimes there's a there's a gap in the logic there, right? It's in a few systems, predominantly Anglo-American systems are the ones that are referred to. Therefore, it's part of international law, which is is completely unsatisfactory as far as I'm concerned. Um, you at the very least need a representative analysis, uh, and then you still need to say whether this prospective rule is part of, the, uh, fits with, and is part of a very different system than what we have in domestic contexts. You take the idea of uti possidides, for example, a Roman property law principle that all of a sudden is used in international law about boundaries between states. And it just doesn't, it, it needs some twist in, it needs some, it needs some development by the court. So I think we need to recognize that the courts do that and we can't falsely anchor this in what states think and do. Um, so it's a bit of a long-winded, um, answer, but I hope that that does address uh, address the question. Thank you, Craig. Um, then I'll uh, give the floor to Professor Wheatley, who would raise his hand, and then we have another question in the chat. Professor Wheatley. Great, thanks, Pat. Uh, three uh, excellent, really interesting papers. My, my question is really directed towards uh, Pauline and Elena. Pauline, I really liked your focus on i like visual metaphors anyway so i really liked your torch metaphor which i took to be really about cognitive frames and the way in which we look at things we're, we're trying to make sense of them as international lawyers and eleni I, I mean you know in, in terms of customary being a complex system i mean i'm already well signed up to to that argument but so my question to, to both of you really is that we're trying to make sense of emergent concepts and emergent concepts depend in large part on the subjective conclusions of, of, of this or that person, the person deciding if there is a norm or if it's a duck or a rabbit in that sense. And, and the focus for us today is on the interpretation. And I think there, there are, there, there are, there are the, there's the kind of issue in my mind, which I think the ICJ doesn't help us with. Um, the identification of custom and the interpretation of custom can we really separate out these two things, particularly when our conclusions depend on what we conclude when we're looking at the materials? So what is the process of the observer in making sense of the interpretation of an emergent concept? 
And is that just more emergence in that sense? And I think particularly in terms of a practical question, what do we do with the practice of states? Because the practice of states speaks to the norm, the scope and content of the norm, but can we use the practice of states in order to interpret the meaning of the norm? So that's my, that's my uh, question for you. Okay, uh, thank you for your question, uh, Stephen. Um, I hope that I made clear that uh, there is no, uh, as, far, as far as I'm concerned, you cannot distinguish or di uh, distinguish in that sense identification from interpretation because you can only identify on the basis of a prior interpretation. And that interpretation need not be very subjective or arbitrary uh, because uh, the interpretation uh, is, is, is gearing towards a, a to unraveling possible uh, avenues uh, for linking uh, it to previous uh, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, so we are dealing with text. So and we, the interpretative uh, framework is not one single rule, one single principle, but the background knowledge in which uh, the, the rules and principles are mutually uh, constitutive, so to speak. So arbitrariness is uh, avoided, uh, but it is not completely uh, not completely avoided. So we need not do deal with it either subjective or objective. We need not deal with either identification or interpretation. We should uh, solve these dichotomies, I think, by making sure that we are dealing with activities and how these act activities are, are carried out rather than with these uh, narrow source kind of, uh, uh, well, what, what is traditional in, in explaining international law. I am completely confused about this so notion of sources, but that's for another uh, for another contribution. So I, I hope that this uh, answers uh, your, your question. Uh, okay, um, I hope Pauline, uh, you're okay with your answer. Um, can I take, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, uh, for the question. Um, I don't know if I'm, I was clear on that. It, it's a really complex system, but the whole idea of um, function of the operation of customer international law um, don't have, uh, doesn't have to do with its identity identification at first sight, at least as its social um, system works. Um, I tried, I don't know if I was successful, to define how the interactions between states, courts, um, international organization works. Uh, if and whether there are actions and reactions between them. At, at the first level of such um, complexity, uh, identification does not matter. At least, at least uh, um, at this uh, level. Um, as to the objectivity or subjectivity of the international judge, uh, I'm in favor of what Professor Cassese um, stated very strictly um, in uh, the decision of the interlocutory appeal uh, that the courts, at, at least international courts, must and do follow social change in the international area. So they do not. Um, bring in their subjective views on the rules. They just follow the changes and they interpret what they have before them. And that uh, what they did in um, dealing with the crime of terrorism. Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know if you are aware or if everybody is aware that um, the decision uh, had many uh, counter reactions, uh, but there was a positive feedback 
uh, since the Security Council in um, dealing with financing of terrorism and uh, in the resolutions that issued after the decision of, um, of the Special Tribunal, uh, adopted in, in essence uh, the interpretation of the tribunal. So you have a positive feedback and you have a real um, evolution to that. If uh, this has been um, the result of subjective interpretation, I cannot say. But for me, uh, the social change uh, that has been little by little um, um, has been attained is very important. I don't know if I not answered your question, uh, but um, I unreached your um, wisdom. I will. I would be very happy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. If if I may also abuse my power as chair here to to also uh, kind of uh, say a few things about what Professor Wheatley asked. I mean the. I understand that there is, there might be, at least in my view, that there might be difficulty uh, indeed of, of clearly separating our identification the way that the ANC uh, examined it as part of the formation of customary international, the emergence of the customary rule and the, the process of interpretation. And I do take the point that interpretation in a wider sense does have some role to play also at the identification stage. That is not always the case. There can be cases where a rule is clearly established, the court simply doesn't look anymore into state practice and opinion years, and the court simply goes into object and purpose, teleology, or systemic interpretation. Clearly, there, I would argue you, you're clearly in the domain of proper legal interpretation. And the same thing, and that's why I have problems when we're talking about interpretation of, of state practice, um, which if you understand it as evaluation, as, as, as Pauline mentioned it, you know, which facts are relevant, yes, but that's interpretation kind of in a, in a broader sense. But if then you're starting talking about teleology, the object and purpose, then my question is, or well, the object and purpose of what? Can be talking about the object and purpose of state practice in and of itself. You need to be talking about the object and purpose of a rule. So automatically, you're already there at the rule stage when you're talking. And I, I would say that the same thing also applies uh, with, uh, with uh, what Craig rightly raised when you're talking about the normative context uh, of, again, a rule, whether that customary rule uh, is in conformity uh, with other existing rules. So there already you kind of have at least a presupposition of the existence of a rule. You're not talking about state practice. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be talking about the object and purpose. Um, and the moment when you try and extrapolate that to the set of state practice, you're already at kind of the rule stage. So there, that's where I, I would say uh, it's, it's relatively easier to, to distinguish between the two. Um, I, I would have loved to continue this discussion much, much more. Um, very quickly, I, I would like... Uh, uh, to to uh, ask uh, Pauline uh, as well about the um, in in her scheme the the lovely torch metaphor uh, that, that she had um, where does she think that um, you know these ideas of teleology and systemic integration uh, come come uh, into play ah and uh, together with that also I forgot. Uh, shame on me that there is another question in, in the chat uh, by Satirius Lekas uh, uh, addressed to uh, Craig. Um, and the question is, do you think that interpretation has a role in the context of identification or more importantly, operation of general principles of law? And if so, are there similarities or differences between CIL and general principles in this respect? And a final question to, to Dr. Micha uh, as well. Um, what I would like to hear more would be a little bit more about the 
that you see entropy, uh, a little bit more in elaboration of how exactly you see entropy in the social sciences, a little bit more elaboration on, on, on that interesting idea. Thank you. So who has to answer first? What question? I think you, you'd self-regulate at this point. <laughs> it's very dangerous with philosophers, <laughs> uh, because philosophers are so arrogant, they always, always want to speak first. Uh, but I, I will be a real philosopher then. I think that the torch is the whole amount of background knowledge, but it can be conflicting. So you, ha you have always the choice between the, the ducks and, and the rabbits, so to speak. And the, the way you choose is, is, uh, is uh, well, can be informed by, by of course, the, the rest of the picture. Uh, where you think, oh, it is more fitting to, to see this as a, as a rabbit because of the whole picture, which is pursuing a, sp a specific purpose or aim. But you construct that aim, of course. So it is within the theolo teleological interpretation that you uh, see something as an emerging or significant pattern and then see, uh, decides that uh, certain rules are not relevant or relevant. And I would therefore, but I didn't uh, elaborate on that in this presentation, but it is not only about identification and interpretation, but also the whole schism between facts and norms are mis in, in misguided, so to speak. You cannot, you cannot speak of acts. And what, in fact, what is, what is investigated is, and it was already seen in an empirical study, it is not the acts of states, of states or whatever, but what is investigated are resolutions and treaties and declarations and the texts. So, and in those texts there are rules. So you, it, it is a, a mistake also to have this dichotomy between facts and, and norms uh, in vari on various levels. But uh, uh, I, I will leave now the floor to the others because you had three questions to three uh, speakers. Thank you, Pauline. So can, can I answer or uh, yes. Greg, uh, have you also a question for Greg? No, you go, you go ahead, Tosmika, carry on, please. Okay. Um, as um, short, <laughs> um, as quickly as I can, how entropy works or it can work um, through interpretation. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, that's why I say the entropian mode of interpretation. Um, without even knowing, of course, the judges uh, do this, um, undertake this process. Uh, when you interpret and you construct uh, the meaning of a rule or a term, as they did uh, in the special tribunal, you almost automatically, if I may use that word, uh, define the actions and reactions with your environment, if you are part of the system. And as courts are part of the system, this complex social system, um, they react uh, to the rule and how um, and which is a state practice and how we interpret if we interpret state practice or to other um, rules and norms. For example, uh, issuing uh, the regulations issued by the Security Council as they did in this case or in any other um, cases. So you have through this reaction uh, to the actions of the other actors and through the variable of interpretation, you have a change in the system. Whether that change uh, will um, stabilize the system or whether in the long run or whether it will evolve the system towards, I don't know where, 
this is another issue uh, to examine. But in any case, this uh, action, action through interpretation is evolutive. I don't know if uh, this scheme is clear, but uh, in, I must um, be uh, very strict to that. Uh, you cannot have the system collapsed because no system has ever been collapsed. It can be changed, of course. And we can, of course, define which change we have, but there's no decay of the system. I think everybody has uh, a sigh of relief that the system will survive. <laughs> so uh, thank you very It'll much. Survive. <laughs> and not only, sorry, just a final remark. Um, not, um, it's not my own conclusion. It's the conclusion of most physical scientists, along with some lawyers and political scientists. But math mathematicians, at least, in principle, say that the system is okay. <laughs> thank you very much. And Craig. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so with this this question, of course, I, I you know it touches on what was already already said to a degree. Um, when we're talking about unwritten norms, interpretation and ascertainment, or interpretation and identification, whatever whatever term you want to use. They do seem to overlap. They do seem to be conflated. They do seem to have a close relationship. I would fully agree with how Professor McCurris has, has, has explained that. There is, there are sort of things you might label as interpretation when you're carrying out the assessment of the evidence of a rule, um, but that task is is quite different to interpretation proper. I would say. Um, uh, of course, that's not to say that there's not points of interaction between these, particularly when we're talking about general principles or, or custom. Um, and I think, again, it does yeah. differ. It does differ. Sometimes there are um, general principles that are very clear and they are unequivocally part of international law and they came to that conclusion very, very quickly, like res judicata or, or certain evidentiary rules or the, the, this is just very clear. And there are some that they will develop over time, might start at a very low level, might be interpreted and added upon by courts and tribunals. So that, that there could be a role um, there as well where interpretation influences, um, influences creation and, and vice versa. Uh, and in response to the last question, are there some similarities and differences? Well, I hope so, because there's not that much on the interpretation of general principles. So I hope to draw some conclusions uh, and uh, reason by analogy from uh, work on custom. And that's one of the things I, I hope today, to today, not only to deepen my knowledge of, of custom, but to gain some inspiration to flesh out my theories of, of how you can interpret and use these, these general principles um, in their operation. Um, I would like to keep these operations clearly distinct. You know, inherently that seems neater to me, but I assume that that's not going to be the case a lot of the time in practice when we're talking about these nebulous norms. I'll take the first step of courts and tribunals dealing with general principles first, and then maybe we can uh, we can battle over uh, over those things. But yes, yeah, so the answer is I, I hope there are some similarities. I think there are some similarities, um, but once again we have to revisit and clarify how you understand each of these norms, right, and uh, how you. Uh, how you see the interactions between them, if any. Uh, I hope that answered the question, but this is something that you know, touches on so many broader things. Perhaps I've uh, avoided the, the crux of it, so sorry. I think that Panos uh, disappeared from the screen. Um, there he is again. Because we are without yes. You. Sorry, I got, I got cut. Yeah, I got cut off at, at the moment when when Craig was was hoping that courts and tribunals would would actually <laughs> take the first. Um, His Excellency Judge Liu Deccan. Thank you very much. Since we have a very limited time available in the morning session, I just want to add a few words to uh, Professor 
uh, uh, Greg's you know, comments. I entirely agree with his contributions on this aspect concerning of the customer international law and the general principles of law recognized by so-called civilized nations. And uh, I just want to point out that, you know, in the uh, practice, you know, those, you know, uh, two uh, things could be, you know, uh, uh, interchangeably, you know, uh, 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 used, you know, in the practice. But so we have to bear in mind that, you know, uh, the general principles, uh, 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 the customer international law and the general principles are different, you know, uh, concepts. You know, in my view, first of all, in the uh, hierarchy of the international law, the custom international law is much higher than the uh, uh, than the uh, 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 general principles uh, of law, and uh, it has the binding force over you know all the states. You know, no matter you are the contracting party to a uh, to to a treaty or not. And uh, secondly, uh, is that you know uh, the general principles comes from the uh, internationally recognized uh, you know uh, 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 you know practice, while the uh, general principles law mainly confined in certain countries or in certain you know even in certain areas. You know uh, sometimes there are conflicts you know between the two concepts on that. For instance, you know as I said in my presentation that, uh, you know, the uh, ingestium generis is a general principle, mostly in the common law legal system, but, but here there's some, you know, differences, you know, uh, different views saying that, you know, it is in the conflict with the uh, principle of the legality that is non nam crime sine Well, this matter is still in the, in the, in the debates. So uh, when we use the, the uh, general principles of law, as well as the custom international law, we have to understand, have a better understanding that, you know, they are the two different, you know, concepts uh, 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 in the law. Thank you very much. May I just, in 30 seconds, just very quickly add something to, to that? Sure. Um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, perfectly fine. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, yeah, thank you very much. I, I mean, I fully agree, I fully agree with you. I would say just very quickly, of course, that observation, that reference to domestic system is unfortunately usually a reference to a handful of, of the same usual suspects of the UK, the US, France, Germany, and Switzerland, Switzerland predominantly. Um, that's simply not okay. That's simply not sufficient. It's unsatisfactory in all, in, in all ways. Um, particularly when you have courts and tribunals just referring to one system and saying, therefore, international law. So I would agree with that. Uh, and I think that hopefully when, when there's even more engagement with, with general principles and the processes of identification, we can come up with a better solution than simply referring to a, a random US court or, or one of the members of the House of Lords. Um, so thanks very much. I, I fully agree. Uh, and on that note, uh, I think uh, a round of applause is needed to all our uh, wonderful panelists uh, for their very interesting uh, presentations. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, this uh, concludes our uh, first uh, panel. Um, we've taken uh, a little bit more time, but that uh, that goes with the territory of having uh, very interesting presentations and uh, a lot of participation uh, from the audience. So what I would suggest, unless anybody has an objection from our uh, panelists and, and uh, chairs, uh, is that we start our next panel at one o'clock. Would that be... Uh, Okay with everybody? So in half an hour? Very well, half an hour, that is fine for me. Okay, if it's fine for yes. the other. I don't see any, any. Okay. perfect. Okay, perfect. so uh, we'll make an announcement that we'll start at one o'clock. So we'll see you all in half an hour's time.